American sketch comedy television series in living color was the definition of an overnight success. Premiering on Fox on April 15, 1990, the show immediately became a pop culture phenomenon when more than 22 million people watched that first episode. The fact that a predominantly Black and entirely irreverent variety show would propel the network to new heights was ironic, given that most Black comedies of the time were respectable, family-friendly efforts. In Living Color tapped into the burgeoning hip-hop culture and delivered laughs with edgy sketches that made Saturday Night Live look outdated in comparison. The star status of the show would only last for so long, though. By season three, a negative snowball effect took over, starting with creator and star Keenan Ivory Wayans getting tired of the network's meddling and censorship efforts. By the end of season four, the Wayans family was no longer involved. The quality suffered, and the show ended after five seasons, on May 19, 1994. Keenan Ivory Wayans wasn't even interested in television, an understandable position since in 1988, he was riding high on the success of his cult hit movie, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, and all he wanted to do after that was make more movies. Those plans would have to be put on hold though. A couple of bigwigs at Fox Broadcasting Company attended a screening of his movie, and after that, they had a meeting where Keenan was made an offer he couldn't refuse. They wanted him to make a TV show for the network. Not only that, they told him he could do whatever he wanted. So what did he want to do? A show like Saturday Night Live, only much, much edgier. A sketch comedy show with female hip hop dancers filling in the breaks between the sketches. The wheels in Keenan's head began to turn. His first thought was about the characters he and his brother Damon had made up in their childhood. In a second meeting with the network, he pitched them the sketches that would later garner big laughs on the show. Two flamboyantly gay film critics, religious leader Louis Farrakhan on the Starship Enterprise, and a couple of knucklehead thugs selling stolen goods from the back of a truck. While it was easy for Keenan to define his vision for the show as a Black SNL, he also wanted to do things differently than that show that by then had been on the air for nearly 15 years. He wanted shorter, tighter sketches. For his show, he didn't want meandering character studies. He just wanted jokes. A sketch wasn't going to be more than four minutes. If it was a one-joke premise, he wanted the time cut down to two minutes or less. All of this work was almost for naught, though. After execs at Fox saw the pilot, it sat in limbo for nearly a year. The network said they wanted edgy programming, but now that they had it in their hands, they weren't sure what to do with it. It's not that they didn't like the show, they just didn't know how everyone else would react to it. They didn't want to offend too many people. The solution, they thought, was to get a buy-in from prominent African-American groups, i.e. the NAACP and the Urban League. Meetings were arranged with different interest groups. Keenan was appalled and refused to attend. He found the whole idea of checking his work with other Black people humiliating. Did Woody Allen need permission from the Anti-Defamation League before he released a film? Did studios clear every John Hughes project with suburban white people? A couple of people on the team did their part to get the ball rolling again by passing tapes of the pilot around to everyone they knew in the industry. One of the people who got the opportunity to view it was a writer for Details Magazine. She thought it was the funniest thing she'd ever seen and decided to write a story raving about it and asked why Fox wasn't moving forward to get it on the air. After the suit saw it, the show finally got picked up for eight episodes. In the beginning, other members of Keenan's family, namely Damon and Kim, had regular roles. Younger brother Sean also got in the mix as the show's in-house DJ, SW1, in the first two seasons. My DJ that keeps the party rocking all night long, SW1, in the house! Another DJ, DJ Twist, took over from season three onward. The rest of the cast was filled out with several previously unknown comedians and actors. Jim Carrey, Tommy Davidson, David Allen Greer, Kelly Caulfield, Takiya Crystal Kima, and Kim Coles. So what about those female dancers mentioned earlier? They were there from the beginning too, known collectively as the Fly Girls. Rosie Perez was their choreographer for the first four seasons. The original lineup consisted of five of them. And of course, you gotta say hello to all my Fly Girls. Starting over here with Carrie Ann, Lisa, Deidre, Michelle, and Carrie. The most notable former Fly Girl would end up being future actress and singer Jennifer Lopez, who joined the show in its third season. We have a new Fly Girl coming all the way from Bronx, New York, Miss Jennifer Lopez. 
The dance troupe would also sometimes be used as extras in sketches or as part of an opening gag. The show didn't only tap into hip hop culture through sketches and the dancers. In Living Color also put the music genre in primetime living rooms every Sunday night, thanks to an infectious theme song from Heavy D and the Boys. Live music performances also became standard starting in the second season, featuring the likes of Public Enemy, Criss Cross, Onyx, MC Light, Arrested Development, Naughty by Nature, A Tribe Called Quest, and their very first performer, Queen Latifah. Some of In Living Color's most prominent skits were The Homeboy Shopping Network. It featured Damon and Keenan as streetwise criminals, Wiz and Iceman, operating an unlicensed home shopping network style TV channel out of the back of their vehicle to sell stolen goods. The time limit imposed on sales was typically due to the impending arrival of the police. Men on Films featured Damon and David as Blaine Edwards and Antoine Merriweather, two effeminate gay critics hosting their own TV show looking at movies from a male point of view. The sketch also spun off into other versions like Men on Television and Men on Books. Oswald Bates featured Damon as a malapropism spouting prison inmate. Fire Marshal Bill featured Jim as an unhinged, dangerously incompetent fire marshal. Homie D. Clown featured Damon as a bitter and hostile convict with a never-ending community service sentence. The antisocial homie was often seen entertaining a group of excited children who all remain his biggest fans, even though he degraded them and thumped them on the head using a sock with a tennis ball inside. Benita Betrell featured Kim Wayans as a humorous neighborhood gossip known for her affection for one Mrs. Jenkins and not being one to gossip and Calhoun Tubbs, a blues singer played by David who sang extremely short songs at the slightest provocation. The popularity and influence of the show was even put on display during one of TV's biggest nights. Before 1992, the halftime entertainment of the Super Bowl was conservative, inoffensive content meant for the entire family and was often not compelling. For Super Bowl 26, though, Fox produced a live edition of In Living Color as an alternative to that year's halftime show. It garnered tens of millions of viewers. This promoted the NFL to rethink its strategy. So who performed at 1993 Super Bowl 27 halftime? Michael Jackson. In later seasons, more cast members joined the team. Jamie Foxx and Steve Park in season three, Marlon Wayans and Ali Wentworth in season four, and Anne-Marie Johnson, Jay Leggett, Reggie McFadden, Carol Rosenthal, and Mark Wilmore in season five. Then at the end of 1992, midway through the fourth season, Keenan left. He'd always battled the network over his ideas for the show since the start. And over time, things just continued to get worse. Fights over risque material were common, with Keenan often lashing out at the censors. He told The Hollywood Reporter in 2019, I didn't have antagonistic relationships with the censors. I wasn't irrational. I knew there were restrictions. It was more about how far can I go? Like, just tell me where the line is. The frustration was that the line was moved week to week. So you could do something one week, but if they got mail, you couldn't do it the next. We were constantly in that dance. In a display of family unity, Damon and Marlon, who appeared as guests on the show that season, but had no contract, also left. Sean and Kim tried to leave, but were unable to due to their contractual obligations. According to a 1993 article from the LA Times, as the season got underway the previous fall, Keenan had begun phasing himself out so that he could concentrate on films and other projects. Jim was among those who locked horns with Keenan over his apparent preoccupation with outside projects. Keenan and I butted heads against each other. He was going off and doing other things, and I felt the ship needed a captain. I felt his heart just wasn't in the show anymore, and you can't do a show like that halfway. Keenan was fighting with the network, plus he didn't want to be there. The final straw for Keenan came when he and Fox tangled over the repackaging and airing of the show's first season. He was unhappy that Fox did it without his approval or participation, feeling the reruns would harm the future value of the show in syndication. The conventional wisdom is that the final season of the show was awful. That judgment fits a tidy narrative that once Keenan and his family were gone, the whole enterprise fell apart and became worthless. It's a narrative that was certainly pushed by the Wayans siblings themselves and wasn't without some truth. Much about the show changed when Keenan left and many of those changes weren't for the better. At the end of the last episode of that final season, a rap trio called To Be Continued, which could be seen as the most fitting name they could possibly have in that moment, 
took center stage. About a minute into their performance, the credits started to roll. And then a minute after that, without so much as a goodbye from any of the cast members, the broadcast just abruptly ends. Now here's some more fun facts about In Living Color. The title of the series was drafted off the fabled NBC tagline of broadcast being presented in living color during the late 50s and 60s prior to mainstream color television. The series won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Variety Music or Comedy Series in 1990, beating out The Arsenio Hall Show, Late Night with David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, and The Tracy Ullman Show. A total of six Wayans family members appeared on the show. While Keenan, Damon, Kim, and Sean started things off, Dwayne Wayans often appeared as an extra and served as a production assistant, and Marlon Wayans became a featured member in season four. While Sean was billed as the show's house DJ, he wasn't actually a real DJ. His job was just to act like one. None of his equipment was connected to anything. He'd listen to the tracks to make sure he was on cue when the camera cut to him to look like he was really mixing. Original cast member Kelly Caulfield and season three edition Steve Park married in 1999 and shared two children. Less than one month after its debut, hard rock group Living Color sued Fox Broadcasting Company, claiming that the network's new show stole the band's name and logo. The lawsuit sought an injunction against the network and producers, as well as unspecified damages. The case was eventually settled. In Rosie Perez's 2014 memoir, she recalls seeing a curvy, big booty girl from the Bronx named Jennifer Lopez at the second day of the New York auditions for a new fly girl. Rosie says that she wasn't the best dancer, but felt she had immense star quality. She insists that she told Keenan repeatedly, that's the girl, but he didn't agree. She says he called her chubby and corny. Keenan denies this, saying that Jennifer was always his first choice. During the televised event where the announcement about who would get the spot was to take place, Keenan did something very out of the ordinary. He had the other girls vote on their new member. The votes didn't end up in Jennifer's favor. The girls instead chose a young woman from the LA auditions named Carla Garrido. Since they were on national television, Keenan says that he really couldn't do anything but accept the decision in that moment. After the dust settled though, he went out of his way to bring Jennifer on board. While Keenan left the show following ongoing clashes with the Fox network, there were also claims that members of the cast weren't always fond of him either alleging that he ran the show more as a dictatorship than a democracy, and was accused of playing favorites with his siblings. Homie D. Clown was based on Paul Mooney. The longtime comedy writer actually wrote for the show for a while. After the writers followed Keenan's orders to mess with him, Mooney said, oh, homie, don't play that. The writers took it from there. Larry Wilmore, host of The Nightly Show, was tapped to write for In Living Color by his brother Mark, who was also a writer for the show, turned cast member during the final season. Jim Carrey's famous butt-talking scene from Ace Ventura Pet Detective came from an incident in the writer's room. Frustrated one day with Keenan's constant rejections of pitch sketches, Jim stood up and read a sketch of his from his butt, in Keenan's direction. The two nearly came to blows before Keenan walked out of the room. One idea that Jim worked on was a sketch called Make a Death Wish Foundation, about a dead kid whose posthumous wish was to go to an amusement park. It didn't make it on air, but he did come up with the face of the kid. It eventually turned into the Fire Marshal Bill phase. Several other comics, including Martin Lawrence, Margaret Cho, Susie Essman, David Spade, Rob Schneider, and Adam Sandler, all auditioned but never made it on the show. On another note, John Leguizamo was offered the chance to become a cast member, but his representation talked him out of it. Keenan's Frenchie character originated from a night out with Eddie Murphy and Rick James. While visiting Eddie, Keenan discovered a closet full of cheap versions of his red leather outfit from his stand-up special Delirious, sent from fans. Keenan thought it would be funny to put one on, as well as a Rick James wig, a gold chain with the letter F on it, some funky shades, and go out clubbing. The night ended with Rick inviting him to join him in his limo, where Keenan pretended to be Eddie's cousin from Augusta, Georgia for the rest of the evening. The live men on football sketch during the show's Super Bowl halftime episode caused some major fallout. It included an implication that actor Richard Gere and track and field athlete Carl Lewis were gay, upsetting both men. Richard's agent threatened a lawsuit, but nothing came of it. Carl's situation was resolved following an apology letter. Apparently, the live show was on a several second delay. Keenan, though, insists it was more like 60 seconds, but the censor that night did not edit out the jokes, apparently because Carl's sexuality was openly discussed in Hollywood at the time. Richard Gere and Carl Lewis weren't the only ones who took issue with the show's sketches. Many other celebrities didn't like their portrayals either, including Spike Lee, 
You like? No. Come on, you gotta like. No. Come I on, don't. look, you gotta like. I don't. Please, baby, baby, please. Please, baby, 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 please, baby, baby, please. Please, baby, baby, please, baby. Arsenio Hall. We got a great show. So, with no more delay, let's get busy. And Mike Tyson. Hi there, Mike. How are you? Well, I gotta say, I'm really ecstatic to be here. Another sketch was so controversial that it ended up airing once and disappeared forever. Deleted entirely from all syndication and DVD versions, and never re-aired on network repeats, the sketch, called Bolt 45, managed to debut on the show's May 5th, 1990 broadcast in the first season. In it, Keenan does a takeoff on a Billy D. Williams Cold 45 commercial, where the purpose of the beverage is to get your lady friend wasted, which happens with his lady friend, played by Kim Coles. It ends with her passed out on her back on a dining table, and Billy D swinging her legs open, alluding to him about to take advantage of her. Keenan argued that it was only mocking the beer, but the network put their foot down. They insisted on several different cuts, which Keenan did. However, the person responsible for putting the tape on air put the wrong one on, so it aired in its entirety. Fox was livid. Since Sean and Kim couldn't leave along with their other siblings due to their contractual obligations, they and other cast members expressed their displeasure with the situation by wearing black shades and not participating in Jamie Foxx's Christmas number at the end of the first episode following Keenan's departure. Out of the nearly dozen members of the inaugural cast, Kim Coles ended up being the only one to last just that one season. Why? Because Keenan fired her. She later learned that he didn't think she was versatile enough. Truly, Kim believed that Keenan overlooked her in favor of his sister, Kim. 20th Century Fox Home Entertainment has released all five seasons of In Living Color on DVD in North America. Due to music licensing issues, some sketches have been edited to remove any and all mention of licensed songs, from characters waxing lyrical to entire performances, including the music video parodies and some of the Fly Girl dancing interstitials. Additionally, that Bolt 45 sketch was omitted, and the soap portion of the Drop the Soap line in the second Men on Film sketch has been muted. As of the making of this video, In Living Color isn't streaming on any platforms. In 2011, plans began to form to make a revival of the original series featuring a new cast, characters, and sketches. However, two years later, Keenan confirmed the reboot had been canceled because he and Fox didn't feel that the show was sustainable after one season. He told the New York Post, The bar for In Living Color is so high that if I didn't feel like we could sustain that, then I did not want to move forward. I just feel like we're in a different time. The talent pool is different, and I don't think that type of show works nowadays. The level of talent required doesn't exist. Not that this generation isn't talented, but they're just talented in a different way. In April 2020, In Living Color celebrated their 30th anniversary. Today, the show's influence is still strong, evident from its former cast becoming box office phenomenons, or when Bruno Mars and Cardi B paid homage to the show in the music video for their 2018 hit song, Finesse. 